Right. I'd like to welcome everyone to our live webinar from the Center for Infectious Disease Research and Policy at the University of Minnesota. I'm Dr. Marty Peterson, and I'm hosting and moderating this uh, live webinar with you today. The title of our webinar is Future Opportunities in Antimicrobial Stewardship Through Diagnostic Inno Innovations. That's a key part of this webinar. And we've got two, we're just thrilled to have the, our two speakers today, um, you know, global experts. Dr. Robin Patel from the Mayo Clinic. She's the director of the Infectious Diseases Research Lab. Betsy Wonderly Trainer. She leads one of the um, areas of research related to diagnostics, and she's the Alliance Director at CARBEX. And diagnostic innovations are, are uh, areas that she focuses on and looks for as part of her daily job. I'd like to everyone to know that we've got continuing education a credit be, that is provided for this webinar, and it's we have it available for pharmacists, physicians, and nurses. And it's being provided to us through MAD ID, and we're very thankful for the educational grant that's providing this continuing education, this live webinar to you um, via BioMario. So I'm just got a few more slides here. The disclosures, as you know, are um, important, and you are able to find those online. We're providing a, a, a link there for you to be able to, to view those. And the activity, as I mentioned, is being funded by BioMarion. Information about claiming credit at the end of this webinar. I'm going to provide that at the end. There's some slides. We'll also provide that in the Zoom chat box, and we'll also send you a follow-up email with all the details. You will be able to complete an online survey within 30 days, and then Mad ID, our, our CE host, will send credits for the pharmacy learners to CE monitor within four weeks of submission. And the AMA PRA Category 1 credits can expect be expected to be received via PDF certificates via email in a similar time frame. So I need to welcome our presenters. And our first presenter today is going to be Dr. Robin Patel. And um, she's speaking today. Her first presentation is something that um, I think you'll all be very interested in, phage susceptibility testing. So she has a lot of insights and some experience she's going to share with us. And I would like you to know that, um, OK, we're viewing Robin's screen now. So Robin, you just need to come on. You need, um, we're seeing your notes. So we just need it. There you go. You're, you're right on. Um, I just want everyone to be aware before I hand it over to Dr. Patel in that it's Zoom, the, the um, platform is Zoom technology. So we encourage you, we want your questions, we want your comments for the speakers through the Q&A uh, box, or you can just send it to us to the chat box. And we will have time at the end of our presentation for the questions. And I just wanna welcome everyone again, if you're just, just uh, tuning in. All right, Dr. Patel. Thank you, Marnie. Thank you, everybody, for joining today. Um, it's a pleasure to talk about phage susceptibility testing. We were chatting before we began, and phage has gotten a lot of people very excited about a potential avenue to treat bacterial infections in clinical practice. And today, I'm going to focus just on this one little area, which is phage susceptibility testing. So. Here are the questions that I'm hoping to try to answer. What is phage susceptibility testing and why talk about it? What is the role of phage susceptibility testing in an ongoing clinical trial? Could phage have clinically useful cross-species activity? And what about biofilm phage susceptibility testing? So hopefully by the time we get to the end of this presentation, you'll have a little insight into answers to these questions. But first, I, I wanted to draw to your attention an activity that the NIH executed with uh, the Antibacterial Resistance Leadership Group that I've had the pleasure to be a part of, where we took a look at a number of important questions in the area of phage therapy. Um, this is a document that was published in Antimicrobial Agents and Chemotherapy in 2022, and the group that put it together was named the ARLG Phage Task Force. Their job was really to put this together. We came up with questions uh, that you might ask if 
for example, you were devising a guideline on phage therapy, and we looked at the literature to come up with uh, the answers to those questions as best we could and to identify knowledge gaps. And I will tell you that we came up with a lot of questions and we identified a lot of knowledge gaps. And the questions dealt with efficacy, dosing and treatment duration, pharmacokinetic and pharmacodynamic parameters, phage stability, determinants of host specificity, routes of administration, in vitro, in vivo correlation, immune response, optimization when phage are given with antibiotics, as we expect that would likely be the case in many scenarios, and the topic of today's presentation, phage susceptibility testing. So I do refer you, though, to that publication because I'm sure there are a lot of other questions outside of phage susceptibility testing that you might have around phage therapy, and hopefully some of those were addressed in our publication. I know that you recently had a presentation from Romney Humphreys, who's an expert on antimicrobial susceptibility testing. And so I think it's very reasonable to frame phage susceptibility testing as the parallel to that. But antimicrobial susceptibility testing has decades of development and experience behind it. And yet anyone working in this area knows that this is constantly evolving. Uh, we're, we use a variety of methods. These methods are specific for each bacterial antibiotic combination. Interpretive criteria are set for each bacteria, meaning bacterial species, antibiotic combination, and these are ever evolving. So every year, for example, there's a new publication of this document called M100 Performance Standards for Antimicrobial Susceptibility Testing that's published by the CLSI, and it's a huge document. Um, I could pull it down and show it to you here, but it's getting bigger and bigger year by year. And this is actually just one of many documents on antimicrobial susceptibility testing because this is a complex area. This is what we're trying to do with phage susceptibility testing, but without all this long experience that we've had with antimicrobial susceptibility testing behind us. And yet, even this is complicated. So back to the ARLG phage task force in the area of phage susceptibility testing, we asked several questions. Uh, the first question was under which conditions should laboratory-based testing be used to select phage for therapeutic use? Now, obviously this is a little bit a cart before the horse, right? Because we're not using phage therapeutically outside of clinical trials or compassionate use scenarios, but we're really envisioning a future where that might happen. And the, what we came up with looking at the literature and based on the, the panel that was part of this task force is that phage susceptibility testing should be considered to select phage for therapeutic use when phage therapy has been considered. And the reason for this is that even the broadest spectrum phage, including phage cocktails, do not cover all members of a given species. In other words, you can't find um, a phage or cocktail that you could say will be active against all members of that species. So logically you would say, oh, well, we need to do phage susceptibility testing. That's what we do with antibiotic susceptibility testing. So that logic would apply. Of course, there's a dynamic tension with the logistics of getting this susceptibility testing done. So the turnaround time and the need to administer phage perhaps, um, especially in acute infections, so you might envision a scenario where perhaps empiric therapy is started with a phage cocktail with predicted good coverage of species, and then that activity is confirmed based on testing and the regimen adjusted thereafter, just like with antibiotics, right? But with chronic infections, you might envision a scenario where the testing is performed prior to administration of phage therapy. And of course, just like with antibiotics, you might use phage susceptibility testing to monitor for emergence of resistance and try to understand therapeutic failure if that occurs. We also looked at this question, which methods are available for determining phage activity against clinical isolates and how should results be interpreted? Well, the task force identified several laboratory testing strategies for assessing phage activity against individual bacterial isolates, but also found no standard in the field. Despite the lack of clinical validation of in vitro testing, in other words, correlation with clinical outcomes, which is really what we're after, the task force considered it may be reasonable to assume that lack of in vitro phage activity against a targeted bacterium would correlate with poor clinical outcome. We actually don't know that, but it just seems reasonable to make that conclusion. We identified several knowledge gaps. 
we didn't find specific evidence of uh, phage use where phage susceptibility testing was used or not used, where we could really answer that question to support the use of phage susceptibility testing. And then of course, phage may be used as cocktails, meaning more than one phage together. And then there's the question as to whether one would need to assess the combination of phages together. Phages are likely to be used with antibiotics. And so there's the question of phage plus antibiotic susceptibility testing. We don't even do antibiotic synergy testing today. So thinking about phage antibiotic testing is complicated. And in many scenarios, phage might be used to treat biofilm associated infections. And of course, many of the tests that we do for susceptibility are in the planktonic state. So there are questions about biofilm susceptibility testing. So lots of questions. What the field needs is standardized, reproducible, rapid, high throughput methods uh, for phage susceptibility testing. Of course, we need to define in vitro parameters that ultimately predict clinical efficacy, but we also at the same time, and I'm not gonna get to this question, but we don't know the conditions under which phage therapy will be active clinically. So that's a bit of a catch-22. There are also questions about thresholds of activity. So with antibiotics, we measure an MIC or a zone diameter and then we interpret that into susceptible, intermediate resistance, susceptible, dose dependent, and so forth. Phage uh, don't have black and white activity. It's not a situation where, you know, it's all or none. And so uh, we don't know whether results should be reported kind of on a scale, whether we can have universal interpretive criteria for all phage bacterial combination uh, situations, or like with antibiotics, whether that needs to vary by bacterial species and the type of phage, and there are lots of types of phage, so this gets very complicated. We don't know whether results should be reported as active versus inactive, or like antibiotics, susceptible, intermediate resistance, susceptible, dose dependent, and so forth. We just don't know the answers to these questions. And we didn't identify a standardized phage susceptibility testing. Of course, again, we need methods that will correlate ultimately with clinical efficacy, but we have yet to know where phage might uh, exhibit clinical efficacy. So this is really a work in progress. What we did identify is several methods. The methods may need to vary by bacterial species and phage, but there were two general methods that were identified. Lytic or plaque assays that are done on solid or semi-solid media, and then assays that are performed in liquid media to monitor bacterial growth in the presence or absence of phage. And so here are a couple of examples, and these are just examples because there are not standardized methods in the field. This is an example of a lytic plaque phage susceptibility testing assay where you take a phage lysate, you mix it with your bacterial inoculum in a soft overlay agar, you pour that on top of a solid agar, you incubate that, and then you look for the formation of plaques. That indicates that you have phage that are uh, doing something to those bacteria on the plate. Uh, this can be modified to an easier format, where here you take a lot of bacteria, and you spot your uh, phage on top of that. So this is a spot test modification of the double overlay plaque assay. And that can be used, for example, to screen a number of phages against a bacterial isolate. And then there are liquid assays. So these are more akin to say broth microdilution for regular antibiotics, where you have your uh, bacteria in broth, you add your phage, and then you look at um, evidence of growth or non-growth over time in the presence of that phage. And one a platform that we've worked a lot with is the Biolog Omnilog. So this is not what was called out by the phage task force, but I'm going to show you some data with this platform and talk about it a little bit as one example, not the example, not the standard in the field, but a possibility. Um, and I'll talk more about how uh, this assay can be used. That uh, platform, the Biolog Omnilog, is an instrument that's been around for a long time. We actually used to use it back in the 1990s in our clinical laboratory for microbial identification, but it is an open platform allowing for the creation of custom arrays. And what it does is to monitor microbial respiration using reduction oxidation with a redox dye in there. So you can tell if the organism is growing over time based on uh, that dye. And what you can do uh, is look at what happens with the control that's shown in red here. So you see over time that optical density uh, increases when you put your bacterium in that well with no active 
uh, against it versus when you have an active like a phage, there'll be a delay in rise of that increase of bacterial op optical density. This can be um, configured on a number of different platforms. Obviously, you can you can measure just straight up OD or you can measure a redox dye like in this system uh, and so forth. And so, so this could be another way of measuring uh, phage activity. And in this case, you would look at the hold time. So the difference between the time uh, to, to um, increase with the control uh, versus the phage treated. So we need standardization in this area. We don't have standards. There are a lot of considerations. So unlike with an antibiotic, which is a chemical, now you have a biological that you're testing and you have to ensure you're always testing the same biological. It's harder to standardize phage than it is to standardize chemicals. So we have to standardize the phage concentrations the liquid media agar compositions and concentrations of whatever they're containing, incubation temperatures and durations, bacterial densities, relative ratios of phage to bacteria, growth phase of the bacteria, define quality control and, and figure out how to interpret results. Just a few things that need to be done. But the quality control is difficult because we're dealing with two biological agents. We've got the bacteria and the phage and the phage can evolve. And uh, that phage stock that's used for phage susceptibility testing has to be very standardized. So we know we're testing what's going to go into a patient ultimately, and that we're not testing you know, something else. And there has to be a way to mitigate any changes in that phage stock over time if you're testing, say, various patients with the same phage to make sure that phage is still viable at the right concentration, not mutated and so forth over time. This can be really challenging if you have a newly isolated phage that you're going to use to treat a patient because you might not have all of the quality control processes already, de already developed to be able to do that. All right, so despite all this perhaps gloom and doom about phage susceptibility testing, we still need to get to it and use it to help us with our clinical trials. So here I want to tell you about a clinical trial that the Antibacterial Resistance Leadership Group or ARLG is executing uh, with phage therapy. The trial is actually called phage. It's a phage 1B, a phase 1B2 trial assessing the safety and microbiological activity of phage therapy in patients with cystic fibrosis colonized with Pseudomonas aeruginosa. And the phage um, being used in this trial is a four phage cocktail active against Pseudomonas aeruginosa. The objective is to assess the safety microbiological activity and benefit to risk profile of a single dose of intravenous phage, this four phage cocktail in CF volunteers with Pseudomonas aeruginosa in their sputum. So this is being used at a time when they're clinically stable uh, and we're really looking at what's happening to that organism in their sputum. Exploratory outcomes include characterization of sputum and serum phage pharmacokinetics, describing the impact of phage on lung function describing the impact of the phage administration on quality of life and characterizing the proportion of Pseudomonas aeruginosa isolates that are susceptible to the phages before and after administration. And uh, that will inform the proportion of trial participants with Pseudomonas aeruginosa isolates susceptible to both the individual phages, the four individual phages, and the cocktail in the trial. And so we're uh, doing the susceptibility testing for this trial. And I wanted to share a little bit about what, what we're doing here. So we're using the Biolog Omnilog as our liquid assay for phage susceptibility testing. And one of the first questions we asked is, well, does this platform even work for regular antibiotics? Because I, I explained earlier that regular antibiotics are easier to test than phage. We wanted to make sure that that was the case. And we took a look at 51 Staph aureus isolates. We performed broth microdilution, and then we performed testing on this biolog, omnilog, with these six antibiotics that are shown here. And we found that essential agreement and categorical agreement was more than 90% for everything we tested except genomycin, which had a few uh, outliers. So we felt like this was a pretty solid platform for testing antibiotics. And then we asked the question, well, what about phage? The problem is we don't know the right answer with phage, right? So we don't have a reference standard. So if you're evaluating um, a new platform, you don't really know if you're getting the answer correct. And so what we looked at here is whether two sites could get the same answer, just agreement between two sites. And we did testing on this platform 
at Adaptive Phage Therapeutics, which is a company that makes phage called APT, and that at our site as well. And we looked at two different collections of organisms in phage. We looked at 19 E. coli phages and 18 E. coli bacterial isolates. And we had a pretty high level of agreement, 94% in this study. However, a lot of the phage that were evaluated were actually inactive, um, which again shows you the need to do phage susceptibility testing. We also looked at 21 Staphylococcus aureus phages and 11 bacterial isolates, and the agreement was 83%. So a little lower than what we found with E. coli, but I think importantly it, for the Staph aureus, there were more active uh, phage that were uh, found in this study. So then on to the ARLG study of Pseudomonas aeruginosa. As mentioned, we're using a cocktail of four phage. They're shown here. And uh, we wanted to make sure that we had um, a fairly uh, solid phage susceptibility testing strategy for this clinical trial. So uh, we performed testing at three different sites uh, to look at this. And these results were just published in the Journal of Clinical Microbiology. At, at our site, we did triplicate testing on the Biolog platform on three different days. At APT, duplicate testing was done on the same day on the same run. And then a third site, the Walter Reed Army Institute of Research, or RARE, did plaque susceptibility testing a single time. This is a little bit of a strange study in terms of not everybody was doing the same thing, but the question we asked is, what is the agreement between the results of phage susceptibility testing with all of these different strategies? And I wanted to show you a little bit of the data uh, around this. The rest you can look at the publication to see. So again, we had these three sites, uh, us, the ARLG Laboratory Center at Mayo Clinic with that liquid assay, the, the biolog assay, triplicate testing on three days, adaptive phage therapeutics doing the same assay in duplicate, but on the same day on the same run, and the the plaque assay being done at the Walter Reed Army Institute of Research. The phages that we studied are shown in the right-hand uh, corner. There are four of them, and they were tested singly as well as as a cocktail. We, we evaluated 145 Pseudomonas aeruginosa isolates, including a subset that was 46 from CF patients who were the subject of our trial. And for the liquid assay, we used a fixed multiplicity of infection of 10, that is, we had 10 to the 6 plaque forming units per ml of phage and 10 to the 5 colony forming units per ml of bacteria. I'm just going to show you one of the results here because there were many, many results. So this is one of the phages called EPA83 against the Pseudomonas aeruginosa isolates. And this is a display uh, on the y-axis of the duplicate testing at APT on the x-axis of the triplicate testing at our site, and these are medians that are shown, and then in color, the results of the plaque assay shown as red if there were no plaques and blue if there were plaques. And you can see that there's correlation, but it's not perfect. Our statisticians worked with us to come up with a concordance correlation coefficient, which results, uh, which assesses both accuracy and precision, and that was fairly high within the individual sites doing testing. So here at Mayo Clinic, as well as at APT, but a little bit lower between the two sites. So what does this tell us? It tells us that phage susceptibility testing is not completely reproducible. And again, I'm not showing you data for all the phages in the cocktail. You can look at the, the article for that. So what we decided to do for the clinical trial is to do both the liquid assay on the biolog as well as a plaque assay. And then if we get discrepant results to do further testing to try to get to our final answer as to whether the uh, phage is active against the bacterium or not, because we're really in a position where we don't have the right answer to this. There are a number of other methods that might be used for phage susceptibility testing, but again, no standard in the field, things like flow cytometry, um, imaging uh, assays and so forth. So any of you who have brilliant ideas about how to come up with the ideal method for phage susceptibility testing, the field uh, clearly needs this. So I wanted to end by sharing a couple of things that we've learned along the way and other areas where we need more work. I mentioned at the beginning that phages were very specific for bacterial species and even within a species, they, they're strain specific. 
There are some uh, situations such as with staphylococci where we have seen cross-species activity. So this is a study that was presented at ASM Microbe in 2022, uh, where we looked at 204 periprosthetic joint infection staphylococcus isolates. Uh, and we tested 38 phages from APT against these isolates using the liquid assay that I described to you previously on the biolog. There were 102 staphyl Staphylococcus aureus isolates, 81 Staphylococcus epidermidis, and 21 Staphylococcus lungonensis, all clinical isolates causing periprosthetic joint infection. And what we found is that there these phages, there were 21 that were active against Staph aureus, 34 active against Staphylococcus epidermidis, and 28 active against Staphylococcus lugdunensis. But what, what was really exciting to me is that there were 32 phages that exhibited activity against more than one species of Staphylococcus. Um, and mostly this was the combination of Staphylococcus epidermidis and Staphylococcus lugdunensis. So that's, I think that's pretty exciting uh, as a therapeutic. But it also shows you the need for phage susceptibility testing because it shows you that you can't have predictable activity against every member of a species in your study. And the last piece I wanted to comment on is biofilm susceptibility testing. You know, we don't have standardized methods for biofilm susceptibility testing of regular antibiotics, not methods that are used in clinical labs. So it's not surprising that I'm going to tell you we don't have those for phage either. This is a study where we looked at 122 periprosthetic joint infection Staphylococcus aureus isolates, and we tested seven ATCC phages against them planktonically using a double, double agar overlay assay. And the results are shown on the left-hand graph. You can see there's not predictable activity against um, any of these uh, uh, isolates. But we did find three phages that were active against um, a larger proportion than the others. And we took those phage bacterial isolate combinations and we screened the phage against biofilms in uh, microtater whale plate format using saffronin staining. And we showed that there was pretty good activity in that assay, but we really don't know, you know, is this the standard in the field? Is there predictable antibiofilm activity when there's planktonic activity? So this is another question that needs to be answered for phage. So I'm going to conclude here. Um, I've shared that there's a need for standardized reproducible phage susceptibility testing methods. There are methods out there. And if you are using phage, I, I think you should think about using some method, but be aware that you know, depending on the method that you use, you may get different results and there are questions about reproducibility as well. So those are some things to consider as you use phage. We um, should be correlating results of phage susceptibility testing with phage outcome in clinical trials to try to figure out what susceptibility tests might be giving us an answer that's predicting clinical efficacy, but we have a lot of work to do in this area. I showed you that some phage can have clinically useful cross-species activity and that phages can target biofilms, but we need more work on methods for biofilm phage susceptibility testing. I'd like to conclude by thanking the ARLG, the Walter Reed Army Institute of Research, uh, APT, as well as the um, ARLG Phage Task Force for contributions to the work presented. Thank you, Dr. Patel, for that presentation. I have many questions. I'm sure the attendees will also start putting some of those in the Q&A box. There's a couple there for you to consider uh, for the Q&A session. And I believe there's Bet Betsy Wonderly Trainer from Carbex is ready. Um, so put your questions down because we're going to enter into Carbex now and their global programs and their focused areas of research related to innovative diagnostics. And I don't want to lo you to lose your train of thought related to the, the, the phage it, information on phage susceptibility testing that we just uh, were a part of. So please, please write down your questions or submit them. And then I'm going to um, turn it over to Betsy to begin her presentation. Thank you, Marnie. Um, excellent presentation, Robin. I'm really glad we're recording this. Um, as Robin mentioned, there are still a, a lot of questions around um, phage and phage susceptibility testing. Um, so you won't see phage susceptibility testing in the CARVEX diagnostics portfolio today, 
Um, but I assure you that we are keeping up with Robin and other leaders in this space to assess whether or not this is a good fit for Carbex. So just wanted to put that out there. All right. I'm sorry, I should introduce my talk. So I'm Betsy Wernerly, a trainer. I uh, lead the diagnostics portfolio at Carbex. Um, and I've been asked to talk about Carbex supported platforms and how we are addressing appropriate use of antimicrobials globally. So let's start with why do we need to support the appropriate use of new antimicrobials? I think everyone knows this, but just to highlight the fact that antibacterials are essential for life-saving um, medical procedures, and they really are the foundation of addressing medical issues globally. So we need to pres preserve the foundation that we have today. Also, you might be wondering, what is Carbex? Um, so I'm going to do this relatively quickly because there are a lot of presentations out there that uh, that go over this in detail, and that's not necessarily the goal of today. Um, but I do want to flag Carbex accelerates. We're a private public partnership, and we are accelerating innovative products against drug resistant bacteria. Um, and we fund therapeutics, preventatives, and diagnostics. Um, we're a global partnership that funds um, and advances high risk projects with big impact potential for patients. We are awarding $822 million from 2016 to 2032 to accelerate innovation addressing the global rise of antibiotic resistance. And we're targeting the most serious antibiotic resistant bacteria, which are included in the CDC and the WHO priority pathogens lists. And we provide non-dilutive funding to the product developers that are driving the innovation. And companies assume a 30 to 40% cost share, depending on what stage of development they're in. So to date, we've received 1,400 expressions of interest, 90, and we funded 97 projects from 2016 from 12 different countries. We currently have 33 active projects um, and 12 phase one therapeutics and preventatives and four uh, diagnostic products that are in verification validation. Six of our programs have advanced development partnerships and two are on the market. And we're funded by BARDA, the Wellcome Trust, NIH, um, UK, the UK government, the German government, and the Gates Foundation, the Canadian government, and Novo Nordisk Foundation. And importantly, we're targeting the most, uh, sorry, just going to move my picture here, targeting the most deadly threats since 2017. So this is an attempt to show where the 92 projects lie with respect to high mortality attributable to or associated with AMR. This is a different view of figure three in the so-called grant paper. Notably, you will see that Carbex investments have aligned well with the leading causes of death attributed to in dark gray or associated with in light gray, AMR. The portfolio leans heavily towards the top four, LRTIs, BSIs, IAIs, and UTIs. Notably, Carbex has also prioritized programs targeting Neisseria gonorrhea, which was not included in the Lancet study. So how can diagnostics support the appropriate use of new antimicrobials? Again, I think we all are aware of this, um, but whoever puts the um, author of Without Diagnostics, Medicine is Blind in the chat first will receive a virtual high five. And Pete Daly, you cannot respond. Um, Diagnostics can, uh, or sorry, syndromic patient manage management often leads to overtreatment of patients and it drives further resistance. Clinical development and market uptake of new therapeutics can be supported by accurate and rapid diagnostics. And resistance testing can roll in older drugs, relieving pressure on some of the newer drugs. For example, recycling Cipro for patients with Neisseria gonorrhea that are still susceptible. And decreasing the time to getting patients on the appropriate therapy can save lives. For example, when we think about sepsis, time matters and rapid and accurate tests are needed in order to decrease mortality rates. As noted previously, Carbex has the largest diagnostic investment in this area. So how is Carbex supporting the appropriate use of new antimicrobials? At the highest level, our diagnostics portfolio strategy is coined aligned by design and that's because we really um, think about what the therapeutic and preventative programs in the portfolio and on the market um, need in terms of diagnostic tools to support their clinical development or appropriate use of those products once they come to market. And so we 
take a look at the portfolio and identify the diagnostic needs. And then we do a, a, a landscape analysis across all the diagnostics that are commercially available and those are that in the uh, and those that are in the pipeline. And then depending on what the outcome is, we either do matchmaking or can support matchmaking. We can support platform expansion, so leveraging the existing install bases that are out there globally and trying to add additional panels or additional targets to panels through dedicated funding. Or we can generate a focused funding call if we really believe that novel in innovation is needed in a particular space. For example, for Nasiri Gonorrhea, we found when we were doing our landscape analysis after we have identified the therapeutic and preventative diagnostic need, we saw there was a real gap in testing at the lower levels of the health system, both for pathogen identification and for resistance testing. And so um, you may have seen that we, in 2023, our funding call related to diagnostics was focused on Neisseria gonorrhea. So a lot um, for this funding call, we uh, cast a broad net for Neisseria gonorrhea diagnostics because we really wanted those low um, level of the health system solutions to come to bear as well as some that could be used globally. So we need affordable, easy to use um, and accurate products, but we also needed wanted some that could maybe serve STI clinics, um, over the counter markets and other locations. And we're still looking for a resistance test at the, at the higher levels of the health settings as well. So we cast a really broad net here with a non-specific TPP, but just some um, high level requirements that were of interest to us. And the result was we had 90 expressions of interest from diagnostic companies. 65 of those companies were in early stage technical feasibility and 25 of those companies were already in early stage product development. You can see the therapeutics and vaccines uh, responses here as well. I won't touch on those today, but happy to go into those detail later. Um, and then um, kind of the applicant demo uh, demo demographics, sorry. Um, small, a lot of small companies, some academic groups, um, and then some medium and even some large, large companies applied to this most recent round. And then you can see the geographic distribution of the applicants as well. Um, so you, um, I can't speak about these programs yet because we're still in negotiations with them and we haven't announced any of the 2023 um, diagnostic funding um, uh, programs, but those are coming. So I will be able to talk to you about those soon. What I would love to highlight for you is our, our um, active portfolio. So the companies we're currently funding and then also some of our graduates. Um, so the majority of the programs funded to date have been targeting sepsis. We've taken a two-pronged approach um, and funded both high-risk, high-reward programs aiming for diagnostics can, that can be run directly on whole blood, like day zero diagnostics, uh, genome key, and helix bind. We've also funded products that require a positive blood culture prior, like products from Avails and where are my other ones? Specific diagnostics. Um, notably, two of our BSI programs incorporate whole genome sequencing, machine learning, and artificial intelligence in order to provide pathogen ID and predict AST based on genotypic data in addition to AI and machine learning. Additionally, due to the dearth of products available for rapid ID and AST for lower respiratory tract infections, we've invested in two products in this space one being developed by the UK-based Proteus and one by US-based Pattern Bio. I'll talk a little bit more about each of these programs now, and then I'll dive further into any of them during the Q&A if there are questions. And this, I think this is pretty straightforward, but the red lines just show what, what um, stages of development we are funding, and the bold red shows where they are right now. This is a little outdated, but that's what it's meant to, meant to serve. Uh, right. Okay, so day zero diagnostics. Um, I wish I had more pictures to show you today, but a lot of these companies are still, you know, in development and don't have a whole lot publicly available. And that is all I can share with you today. So 
Um, you might have to use your imagination or close your eyes as I talk and you can picture these systems. Um, so Day Zero's diagnostic system is designed to extract bacterial DNA directly from a patient sample, such as blood in the instance of the program that we're funding for sequencing without the need for culture. The company's machine learn learning algorithm then analyzes the genomic data to identify the pathogen and determine its antibiotic susceptibility and resistance profile within hours. The system is designed to allow for simultaneous testing on a broad range of bacterial species, species and their antibiotic susceptibility instead of just a handful of species. Um, the company is currently in develop the development stage and I think that's all I'm going to say about them for now. We can come back to them. Avails Medical. So Avails is based in California. They're developing an electronic um, antibiotic susceptibility testing device to speed up healthcare providers' ability to determine effective therapy. Uh, the Avails EST will use electronic biosensors that fit into um, AST panels to provide phenotypic results. From a positive blood culture sample, it aims to identify the most effective antibiotics within a few hours rather than days. And the EAST has 96 integrated electronic sensors in a disposable lid that would fit onto widely available AST plates. Um, I think I will start, stop there. They're currently in development as well. So Carbex funds technical feasibility and um, early stage product development. So these two companies are in their last stage of funding with Carbex. Genome Key, they're based in Bristol, UK. They're developing a rapid diagnostic for sepsis as well by combining novel bacterial DNA extraction techniques, um, next generation DNA sequencing and machine learning DNA interpretation, again, directly from whole blood. They're seeking to determine the presence of bacteria in the blood sample identify its species and determine its anti antimicrobial susceptibility within hours, again, at high accuracy. Um, Genome Key actually just wrapped up their technical feasibility portion of work. Uh, now we'll move to SpeedX. They're our last active program we'll talk about today. So they are based in Sydney, Australia, and they're developing uh, rapid molecular test using PCR called the insignia to assist in detecting chlamydia and active infection of gonorrhea. Additionally, through susceptibility testing, the technology will identify the best antibiotic choice of treatment for gonorrhea. Um, and they're also, this program also targets um, oral administrative antibiotics that are generally readily available in low and middle income countries, including cefixime, ciprofloxacin, and azithromycin. So that's our active portfolio. Um, and in addition to the Nasiri Ganaparia programs, which we'll be announcing soon. And so now I'd like to shift to some of our graduate programs, which you'll likely see on the market um, in the near future as they continue to move forward uh, outside of the CARBEX portfolio. So Pattern Diagnostics is based in Austin, Texas, and they are developing a rapid ID and AST test to diagnose drug resistant infections from lower from VAL samples. Uh, their technology combines single cell analysis with deep learning to deliver a fast and definitive diagnosis. And their approach involves the encapsulation of individual microbial cells into picoscale droplets with a cell viability dye that concentrates within the droplet environment. And it produces an easily detectable fluorescent signal in the presence of a live cell. Uh, and notably, they can handle polymi polymicrobial infections as well. So they've completed their development work with us and they've moved into late stage development outside the Carbex portfolio. Another program focused on lower respiratory tract infections is Proteus. This is an academic group based in Edinburgh, UK, and they're developing a technology to visualize bacteria and the host response um, through neutrophil activation in the deepest parts of the human lungs in just 60 seconds. Using bacteria-specific smart probes and fiber-based imaging, which is inserted into the lung. The technology is meant to be used in critical care units. 
and at the bedside of patients who are mechanically ventilated and critically unwell. They wrapped up uh, the last stage of funding with us as well and are currently in their clinical studies. Helix Find is based in, based in Marble Mass, and they are developing a proprietary rapid platform, provides culture-free characterization, again, direct from blood of pathogens and their resistance mechanisms directly, excuse me, from patient specimens. Um, they are, sorry, I had something else. Their menu is 20, 20 plus pathogens with sensitivity down to a few cells per milliliter from a small blood sample within a few hours. And they actually have a nice workflow on their website that I am able to share. So you just take your three ML of um, blood in an EDTA tube, you insert it into the cartridge, which is about yay big, and um, then you insert the cartridge into the instrument. The hands-on time really is quick. Um, and then you wait about four hours and you get your results reported. Um, T2 Biosystems. So um, they're using magnetic resonance technology to identify pathogens and resistance markers, again, directly in whole blood. Um, they, we funded their the development of their T2 resistance panel, which was a follow-on test to the uh, bacteria panel. And you can see the list of targets over here. This one is available for research use only in the US. Uh, and specific diagnostics uh, was acquired by Bumeria. So it's now the Bumeria Reveal AST. And the AST system identifies antimicrobial susceptibility in four hours directly from positive blood culture samples. So they use a printed disposable sensor array positioned over each of the 96 well um, antibiotic plates rapidly and sensitively to detect the emitted uh, volatile molecules that are the first sign of bacterial growth. Um, this product is available at CE marked in the in Europe, and they're currently completing their clinical studies in the U.S. So that's that's the CARBEX portfolio, both our graduate programs and our active programs. But I would be amiss without mentioning how the diagnostics landscape has just boomed um, since COVID. COVID really, I think, identified the need for diagnostic testing and um, spurred significant innovation and development. And many of these companies are looking to pivot as uh, testing volumes decrease for COVID and they have been um, pivoting into the AMR area. And one of our goals for the 2023 funding call was to try to leverage some of those investments and give them a place to pivot to if they really are meaningful technology that has been serving an unmet need in the marketplace. So this uh, slide is from Kavi Ramji that find, I just like how he collected everything so nicely here. It really shows the breadth of rapid lateral flow tests, um, you know, some, some digital health tools that have, have evolved to your point of care near, near patient testing platforms, and then to some of the really large lab-based high throughput systems that are, that are now on the market. The Longitude Prize also really spurred diagnostics development um, for AMR specifically. And they highlighted diagnostic needs and LMICs in a really meaningful way. It was an 8 million year, um, pound prize to spur innovation for diagnostics testing a targeting AMR. They had a bunch of seed um, funding opportunities and they provided grab around support to the companies that were competing. And they had 58 teams competing for the prize. And this is just a small um, array of the types of companies that were competing. And I think they are completing their clinical studies now for the um, final review of, of companies that are competing for the prize. Huh? Um, and I think this is important because when we look at the global AMR disease burden, we see a, a significant portion of AMR is, is based in Africa um, and Southeast Asia, Latin America. And so I think um, it's, it, we all, I think, are, are really starting to try to shift the thinking to how can we leverage products that can really serve these markets where the high desert, high desert where there is a high burden of disease. And global stewardship and access of diagnostics are vital to antibiotic sustainability. 
And CARBEX is not just about funding innovation. We're really trying to think about how we make it sustainable. And diagnostics are key. You know, innovation delivers new solutions to um, address the global threat of drug resistance, but access supports patient care and helps to control the spread of drug-resistant bacteria. And antibiotic stewardship, including the use of diagnostics, helps reduce misuse and overuse of innovative products and promotes responsible use. Um, and one way we're doing this, which isn't direct funding to companies, but we are funding the AMR test directory in collaboration with FIND. And in order to, well, it was originally developed for internal landscaping purposes at CarbEx, but we made it publicly available and are supporting maintenance of it to support the global awareness of tests focused on AMR, um, those that are on the market and those that are in development. And this will hopefully support decision-making for organizations that are searching for products to meet their clinical needs. And it can support matchmaking for companies that are looking for a specific diagnostic test for clinical development programs, vaccine campaigns, et cetera. So this is just a screenshot of the AMR test directory. They've just introduced an interactive map, which is really neat. You can dr drill down and see what companies are where, doing what. Um, you can parse the data in many ways. You can look at the assay aims, is it ID, is it phenotypic, genotypic? Um, you can look at, um, break it down by syndrome. You can uh, parse the data by organism class, antimicrobial resistance class, the different types of technology, and then the different stages of development. And then you can do some really cool exports. So this is one we did to show the AMR diagnostic landscape at the highest level. So um, we broke it down by some of the priority syndromes, including bloodstream infections, urinary tract infections, STIs, and LRTIs, and then broke it down by different healthcare levels of the healthcare system that are being served, lab-based, near point of care, and true point of care. And then we separated commercially available tests from tests in development. And I think it just helps you really understand where, where development efforts are focused right now and where the commercial market is you know, heavier or lighter, especially when you start to look at the lower levels of the health system. And we think about um, where these tests really need to be used. Another way to parse the data is uh, looking at technology type. And so we, we generated this report um, with a fine team to look at the commercially available and tests and development um, by technology you can see the biophysics and chemical um, test category, growth-based tests, so your phenotypic tests, amino assays, molecular tests, and sequencing. Um, and then you can see them again, broken down by the different levels of the health system and broken down by syndrome. So it just kind of gives you a sense of what's happening, what's out there. And then lastly, this one's really interesting to me, you can produce syndromic tables. So say you really want to know what's going on with um, Neisseria gonorrhea diagnostics, which happen to want to know. Um, you can generate a report just for that syndrome. So this lists the company name, the country um, head of the company headquarters, the test name, stage of development, syndromes they're targeting, pathogens they're targeting, the assay aim, type of technology, and then if it's lab versus point of care. All this information is provided by the companies, um, but it's also checked by the, the team that does the input. And this is just a snapshot of the list. The list goes on. There's actually quite a few manufacturers in this space now. Another way we're supporting global access to diagnostics and stewardship of antibiotics is by supporting IVD development ecosystem activities in LMICs. So in collaboration with FINE and CCAMP, we've developed a workshop covering the basics of IVD product development with a focus on India for this first, um, the first module that was, or the first set of modules that was developed. The aim is to see robust product development plans included in the submissions that are coming into CARBEX and received from high um, disease burden countries. And there's, the content is specifically designed for companies that are making the transition from academia to product development. I mean, we worked with Pete Daly at Fine to generate the content. And I think he did a really great job, job um, kind of meeting the companies where they are and making recommendations based on the maturity of the company, um, especially when it comes to like implementing a quality management system. How do you do that if you're just a three-person company versus a 30-person company versus a 300-person company? So this is all available online on the website. Um, and you can see some of the modules here. There's the intro to IVD product development, the product development process. We go into design control, 
quality management system, good lab practices. And then he does, he does a deep dive um, case study, which highlights why the fundamentals matter. And after each webinar, we had a Q&A with experts in the space and industry representatives to really kind of just do a back and forth to parse through some of the intricacies of each of these different topics. Looking ahead, we're hoping to do more ecosystem development, moving toward developing new content for the IVD bootcamp, um, but also conducting these workshops in person in 2024 in India with C-Camp um, and in uh, Indonesia with Find. We're also looking to do more market shaping, working with new global partners to better understand how best to impl implement diagnostics, vaccines, and therapeutics in LMICs. We also have an evolving strategy. We had a strategic review in 2020 and a refresh in 2023, which are guiding the CARBEX strategy. And that we had significant representation from LMICs in our 2023 review. And there'll be new CARBEX funding announcements soon. Um, as I mentioned, 2023 rounds will be announced soon. Um, the new funding opportunities for 2024 will be announced soon. So subscribe to our website in order to receive notices when the funding calls are announced. And that is all I have. I hope that was informative and interesting. Thanks so much, Betsy. Yeah. A um, lot going on there. I think I think people listening are wondering, okay, you know, how I'm going to incorporate this into information yeah. and workflow in the future. Um, and I do I do have a, a quick question before I uh, I'm going to toggle a little bit back and forth between you and Robin, and then there's questions that are coming in from our attendees as well. So please please submit so um, you can get your questions answered. Um, when you're assessing uh, something that's point of care versus laboratory based, does that does that matter to Carbax? Are you trying to get more of the technologies to to a point of care or even at home? It's a great question. I think it depends on the syndrome and it depends on the diagnostic need. So if the commercial market is already strong and healthy and there are products available that meet the clinical need, then it wouldn't be a priority. It's only where there's a, a clinical need and a diagnostic gap where we usually focus our funding calls. Nasiri gonorrhea, we primarily focused on lower levels of the health system because that's where patients are seeking care that are infected with, with Nasiri gonorrhea. Um, except for resistance testing, we did we did consider some um, larger systems to do to support reflex testing there. Basically, nicer gonorrhea, chlamydia, yes, no answers at home. But if you need to know susceptibility, if you get a positive, that would be more potentially yeah. laboratory based. Yeah, or, or or clinic, STI clinic based, clinic. perhaps clinic. not at home. But I think there is still some interest in and um, platforms that could potentially expand there someday. Yeah. And Robin was on our strategic review for that round. So feel free to ask her any questions as yeah, well. Yeah, that's correct. That's correct. Uh, I mean, I can check in speakers know each that. other well. I mean, I, I think it's a really good question because what maybe you're struck um, about Betsy's presentation is so many diagnostics and so much point of care. And I, I love that slide um showing you know everything from COVID and all those tests the point of care that everybody probably still has in their home and is using <laughs> somehow I don't know in the right way or not the right way but using still and everybody learned how to do a lateral flow assay at home like everybody in the population and it really changed the way we think about diagnostics and how they're used and you know, I, I like to think very futuristic. These technologies are now making it possible to do what we did in laboratories at home. Like even molecular tests are possible at home. And so um, I think we need stewards to really think about what's the best way to practice medicine and to get people who need treatment on the right treatment and who don't need treatment, not on treatment, wherever they are you know, and to to think about a world where maybe not everybody needs to go to an emergency department or clinic to make that happen, because that's what we saw happen with COVID. And then, you know, we need to make the, the test to make that possible and figure out how to build the systems to deliver those tests and so forth. So it's good you're getting excited about that. And I guess, you know, Betsy's thinking about the next step. I'm thinking about, yeah, but what yeah. will the world look like 10 or 20 years from now? I think it could look a lot different based on what's possible with technology and some of the lessons learned with COVID-19 as well. 
And I think if you look historically at a lot of our investments, they were the large lab-based systems. And so we've done a lot there. And I think, you know, we've, we're proud of those, but we're also interested in, in, in diversity and especially geographic diversity. And a lot of those systems will be very difficult to implement in OMICs. And so thinking about the global disease burden again, where the products are needed, what form factor those products have to be in in order to be, and what price points they have to be offered at in order to be clinically meaningful and used at scale is, is really important. And, and you're thinking about uh, global, but even, you know, across the U.S., we have so many different yeah. healthcare sites. And, you know, I, I work in a certain kind of place, but that's not where all patients are, right? And so we have to think about delivering the right diagnostics to meet the needs of our, our patients, our people. Yeah. All right, before we leave, I mean, I'm, I'm going to come back to, to some questions related to, to Carbex portfolio. But I had one um, also around urinary tract infections. Yep. Diagnostics, you know, is that when you looked at your uh, fine data set and find, I think it's finedx.org yep. is how people can get to it. Um, just because it's such a hard one clinically where you're trying to understand, you think, even think in the US, you're trying to understand, do they have a clinical infection? And then of course, susceptibility and treatment because it could lead to bloodstream infections, et cetera. Yeah. So yeah. I'm wondering where you're at with um, developments in that space. With UTI? Oh, it's a complicated one. Um, you know, sample collection and, and getting good quality samples is like the, the first step of, of diagnostic testing, right? And so I think this is an area where we still struggle with um, with that upfront step. And we are are trying to think creatively about how um, how to address that. We did include UTI in our early calls. So in 2017, 2018, 2019, we had broad calls, pretty much anything ID and AST across any of the syndromic areas. And we had some UTI investments then. Um, obviously we didn't last year because it's in the gonorrhea, but I think it is an area where it's complex. Um, there's definitely clinical need there, um, but it, it's it's still something we're, we're exploring on how we can best support um, the diagnostic gaps in that space. Yeah, it's a good area to to focus as yeah. well, especially even when you're um, conducting your clinical trials. Yeah, you know, in enrollment of patients, uh, outcomes, etc. Uh, I want to switch to Phage, Dr. Patel. Um, tell us a little, just a little bit about the question that that I have is um, with the ninety six well platform. The, the stock or the phage that you choose to put on that 96 well against whatever said pathogen that you're testing, take your clinical study or pseudomonas. Mm -hmm. Is it is it change or is it always the same or are they individually in each well? So I'm, I have that question and then I wanna know once you find one, then what kind of PK, PD studies are you doing? Are you, they're not be, any being done at this time? Okay, so Too really much. good questions. So I, I think the vision uh, would be that if phage therapy works, and and you know we don't we don't know the answer to this. So so um, phage some phage get approved for use in clinical practice, so they can be prescribed in some way in the U.S. In different countries, there are different scenarios for how phage gets used. But to take an American perspective, there would be some approval of phage or phages. Uh, against a specific bacterium, presumably for a specific type of infection, just the way we approve any anti-infective, right? And then uh, prior to use of that phage or phages in clinical in a patient, you would want to use some phage susceptibility testing where you would want to do it soon after you prescribed it to make sure what you prescribed is going to work, just like we do with antibiotics. So, um, you know, presumably there would be some choices because I showed you that phages aren't, you know, predictably active against every member of a given species. So just like with antibiotics, presumably we might have a panel of phages that we're testing. Um, I don't know what number, but it, it would depend on, on what's available. So then you have to have a stock of each of those that clinicians might be prescribing to test in the lab. And that stock has to be maintained under quality processes. So we're no, we know we're always testing the same thing that you're giving to your patients we know the concentration, we know they're viable and, and so forth. So in that way, I think it would be like 
antibiotic susceptibility testing, but maintenance of that stock um, is very important. And then there are a lot of upfront steps, and I see some questions in the chat about those upfront tests. How did you get to selecting those phages in the first place that you might be using? Uh, one really good question was, how do you make sure they're not lysogenic? Because phages, some phages can undergo um, a, a life cycle where they incorporate into the bacterial genome. And we do not want to be using those for phage therapy. We want to be using lytic phages. But those determinations should really happen upfront of when something's going on, say, in a clinical microbiology laboratory to, to match a phage um, with a bacterial strain. Uh, um, it would really be making sure that phage is even appropriate to assess against um, a patient's bacterial isolate uh, upfront, if, if that makes sense. About PKPD, uh, I didn't really get to that, but you saw my list of all the questions, right? And that right. was on there. We, we really don't know uh, how to dose phage. We don't know the ideal route of administration. Obviously, that's probably going to vary with the type of infection you're treating. Um, how much to give, um, whether you should redose it, and at what frequency, how you should be giving phage with respect to dosing antibiotics, and probably that varies with different antibiotics and different phage. Um, we have a lot of research to do, so that's really good. So anybody interested in you know PKPD, there was a whole section of questions in that document, the ARLG Phage Task Force document that I put the reference up for about PKPD, and Tom Lodis led the PKPD work that went into that. He had a team actually looking at PKPD questions. So I refer you to that because that's a whole separate set of questions beyond just phage susceptibility testing. Thank you for that question. Um, there was one question. I don't know if everyone's looking in the chat box and uh, Dr. Robin, Dr. Patel has been answering them, but there was one around the, you know, the diagnostics, um, in, in more of a molecular approach. Oh, yes. And Did that you, was my that bad. So, so another way to assess phage susceptibility testing um, would be through sequencing, sequencing of the bacterium with which your patient is infected. And so you would want to look at genetic markers of susceptibility and resistance to that phage in the bacterial genome. And yeah, that's a really good point. Um, we have some knowledge gaps, right? We, we don't know the mechanism of action, like the binding site and conditions of activity for every phage. And we don't know mechanisms of resistance, which are presumably if it could have been active SNPs in, in maybe a binding site or something like that. We don't know all of that. But once we do know that, then I think um, we're, we're seeing a lot of rapid molecular diagnostics, like what Betsy talked about. And you could think of a genetic test, either sequencing based or even um, a NAT test that can detect certain SNPs or the presence or absence of a resistant or of a, a binding site um, that you might devise to uh, rapidly assess phage susceptibility. I think that's a little bit down the road right now, but I think it's certainly possible that we could get to that point. And that would be really nice because then you might be able to get a rapid answer, you know, which phage should I pick to treat my patient with? Yeah. And you can imagine, you can then overlay that information with antimicrobial yeah. susceptibility testing that some of the other platforms already yeah. and I think, are in development. As yeah, Betsy. I think that, you know, once we get to a point where we can rapidly generate that bacterial whole genome sequence data, then we can answer both questions at the same time. Um, and maybe one question first and then figure out how to answer the second question and eventually get to answer all the questions that we have. I just wonder if there's any other, um, oh, Betsy, some people are, are answering. Oh, you already answered. Are you gonna declare? The was winner the was Grace Arenas, Elaine Maria, founder of Foundation Maria and the Fiumaria family umbrella. Well done. I think Paul Adder came in second. So congratulations, Paul. <laughs> Excellent. Um, some other questions. Let me just see if there's any other questions here in the... I think we got to them all. Oh no, another one just came in. I, I, think, I think people are, are wondering as these things, as, um, 
the technologies become more advanced, how do we bring them to the local, you yeah. know, setting um, into the labs? Yeah, the labs and clinics. It's a great and question. And then to yeah. me, the interface between the laboratory, the diagnostic steward, and the clinical antimicrobial steward, that merging together as this technology evolves and develops is going to be really important because getting that timely information, being able to then execute um, and use appropriate pharmacodynamics and kinetics to then treat individuals, whether it be phage or antimicrobials. So, um, Robin, okay. can you comment on that first? I mean, I can comment on that. I think that's a really insightful question. And yeah. because we're in such a rapid um, development and deployment of technology phase in medicine right now on the diagnostic side, there really isn't a great system that's built to deliver that. And so this is an opportunity for antimicrobial stewards to, to think about how that would happen. There um, aren't, to the best of my knowledge, regulations, for example, that require institutions to, to use any, any particular of these diagnostics. And I'm not suggesting there should be, but um, how, how is uptake going to happen of things that will necessarily make a difference and how can you help? So I think actually having a session like this is a first a start to that, right? Building awareness around what's possible and what's coming. There's mm -hmm. also the possibility for you in the field to think about what you need because there's so many tests that can be developed, but why are certain tests being developed and maybe the ones that you think you need not being developed? So have a voice there too. Um, you know, in, in various ways. And now, you know, Betsy, so you can reach out to her and say, <laughs> Hey, I don't understand why Carbex isn't developing da, 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 da. and, and then maybe she can think about it and maybe they will, but I mean, there are a lot of ways of getting that, but then there's also just understanding what's out there. Like what, what could I bring in and how could I use that in my practice? And I don't think we have a great way of doing that either. Traditionally, a lot of this testing has been done you know, in a lab, uh, and it's been the people in the lab who are behind some curtain who are making those decisions. But now we're getting so many diagnostics coming out so quickly, and a lot of them are not necessarily for use in the lab. So who's deciding about those and where they might get used? So get involved and, and think about it and think about how you can change practice. Because the other side of this is that to really leverage the benefit of some of these diagnostics, we need to practice medicine in a different way. And so yeah. that means that we need to redesign everything and think about how we how we manage our patients, um, maybe even before there are patients, right? If, if they're going to test at home, they might be making those decisions themselves that they're going to do the tests. And then how do the right actions get taken from those tests? Uh, so there's a lot to think about here. I think it's an exciting time to really um, redesign how we deliver healthcare. I think that's a perfect closure.